Now there's a, a kind of name for this product here. Do you remember from the videos what would be a name for this general type of setup we have here? Putting, considering this functional group and this functional group. Um, and, uh, an L? Pardon? Uh, is it an aldol? Now the reaction is called an aldol reaction, of course. Why is this called an aldol reaction? Well, the al stands for this aldehyde group. And the OL stands for this alcohol group. So it's called an aldol reaction because uh, we're producing an aldehyde and an alcohol. Although, before I forget, um, that's not actually not the best name because this reaction also can work for ketones. Okay. Even, when it, even when you work with ketones, you still call it an aldol for some reason. But, so it could be either an aldehyde and alcohol in the product or a ketone and alcohol. Now, if this is the alpha carbon, what should we call this? This would be our beta carbon. So this would be a beta hydroxy aldehyde. Beta hydroxy aldehyde. That's actually a very logical name once we look at all the different pieces. Now, this is asterisk because it used to be the carbonyl carbon, but it's not the carbonyl anymore. Now it's just the beta carbon to this carbonyl. So it's a beta hydroxy aldehyde. So, what do we get from this category one attack? A beta hydroxy aldehyde. Although, if we started with a ketone, we would get a beta hydroxy ketone. So how do you know when to use this on a synthesis problem? Well, if you know that the product is a beta hydroxy aldehyde or ketone, then almost certainly you want to use the aldol reaction. Good. These steps are all reversible, incidentally. So for the record, I'll use equilibrium arrows. Going back to this step where we did this deprotonation and made this enolate. Mm -hmm. Normally, you can't put a negative charge on a carbon. What is it that allowed us to put a negative charge on this carbon? Uh, it's in basic conditions. Normally, uh, well, the base well, would not well, be able I mean, It's the, uh, the resonance from right. the uh, carbonyl group. There's another resonance structure where the negative charge so would be on this oxygen. And in fact, that confuses students because that means oftentimes the instructor would draw the enolate with a negative charge on this oxygen. So it's perfectly permissible to draw the enolate with a negative charge on this carbon or on this oxygen. But I think it's better to put it on this carbon because it's the carbon that's acting like a nucleophile. But you might see in the notes the negative charge on this oxygen. But either way, it's still an enolate. Now, we did this as a category one, but it's also possible for it to be a category three. What, 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 how could we get this to go on and be a category three? Also, if we did this conditions under heat, the reaction would continue. Okay. Okay. Well, you actually remember this portion of the mechanism very well. So let's see whether we remember what would happen if there was heat. If there was heat, there would now be further reactions. This is where people sometimes get stuck, actually. You might be stuck here. I you remember, know I remember, I remember watching it, but I don't rem remember the mechanism when it's in. Okay. Oh, now, remember, this is going to be, do you remember, what, 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 what does category three mean? It's going to be a, a nucleophile with a double bond. Category three is that we're going to go on to here. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which means that the carbonyl oxygen has completely left. The carbonyl oxygen is gone. Under these conditions, with the carbonyl oxygen, no, it, the carbonyl oxygen will be gone. Now, who's the nucleophilic atom here? Uh, the carbon. Which carbon? The alpha carbon. The alpha carbon. In category one, the alpha carbon would only have attacked once. But in category three, the alpha carbon is attacked twice. So we have to come up with some way that this alpha carbon can attack this asterisk carbon again. Well, what allowed it to attack the first time? It deprotonated. Mm -hmm. By deprotonating the alpha carbon, it was able to attack the first time. So the step that people always forget is, to get a second attack, you should do a second deprotonation. Mm -hmm. After all, we just regenerated our base, mm -hmm. right? Since we just regenerated our base, we can do a whole second deprotonation here. So 
this is the step that everyone always forgets. Okay. If you want to do a second attack, it's logical to do a second deprotonation. What is it that allowed us to deprotonate the alpha carbon? Normally, bases can't deprotonate carbons. Why were we able to deprotonate yeah, the resonance? That's the right. Carbonyl. Once again, we formed another enolate. Mm -hmm. And once again, in the textbook, you might actually see the resonance structure drawn where the negative charge is on this oxygen. But I think it's better to leave the negative charge here because this will be the nucleophile. All right, now um, what are we going to do uh, next? Well, remember that we need to get to this product over here. What do we need to accomplish to make the product look like this? Um, well, uh, we're going to have to make a pi bond and we're going to have to get the OH group to leave. That's right. A pi bond between who and who? The carbonyl, uh, the former carbonyl carbon and the alpha carbon. Right. Between our asterisk carbon and our alpha carbon. Here's where I find these labels to be very helpful because it shows these are the two atoms that are reacting with each other. Um, well, we're all set to do that. All right. Are we allowed to kick off this OH group under these conditions? No. Yes or no? Actually, in this condition, oh, it will be permissible. Okay. So what, what are we going to do when we get this? We're going to get an HO minus. Why is that permissible under these conditions? Because they're basic conditions. Yeah, basic conditions. Okay, so under basic conditions, it's permissible to form negative intermediates. Okay. We can't form positive intermediates. So let's show the product from that step. Okay, very good. Again, I like to kind of draw it in this confirmation to match this pattern over here, but you've got the right idea. product here. Once again, we've regenerated our acid catalyst. Mm -hmm. So notice the carbonyl oxygen has been completely blasted off. Our and then beta, our, our, uh, is that our basic catalyst? Um, I, don't, uh, I don't know if I quite followed you here. I was just, just saying that the, the carbonyl oxygen has been completely... Uh, okay. I thought you said you re we regenerated our acid catalyst. Oh, I should have said base catalyst. Yeah. We've regenerated the base catalyst. That's right. Uh, and that's how the carbonyl oxygen left. So we can also say here in our general pattern, that the carbonyl oxygen is left as hydroxide. Notice that in the category one, since there's only one attack, the carbonyl oxygen is still around. Okay. But if the alpha carbon attacks twice, it has to kick this oxygen off. And under basic conditions, it can leave as hydroxide. So it's gonna need heat to do that. Yeah. And typically, if we wanted it to get this far, we would have added the heat at the very first step. Okay. If you just show heat at the first step, you know it's going to be category three. So basically, the, the upshot is under cold conditions, the aldol condensation is a category one reaction. And under hot conditions, the aldol condensation is a category three reaction. So we can choose whichever one we want. We need a name for this product here. Well, 
Notice that here we have a double bond. I think we've seen in the past that double bonds are considered a source of unsaturation. Mm -hmm. So this would be considered an unsaturated part of the molecule. Well, where is the unsaturation? Between the alpha carbon and this is the beta carbon. So this is what's called an alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde. Alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde. I find that students tend to get these two names confused. For example, a lot of times students would say this is an alpha-beta hydroxy. But that doesn't make sense, because there's no hydroxy on the alpha, there's only a hydroxy on the beta. So this is just a plain beta hydroxy. Here, it makes sense to say alpha-beta unsaturated, because the double bond is between the alpha and the beta carbon. So we don't want to confuse these two names. 